Hello everybody. <laughs> Welcome to The Power of Social Media. My name is Ashley and I am from Northern Ireland. I run the hashtag I'm not drunk lifestyle blog and I have with myself Robin. Hi. And I also have Charlie. So thank you all so much for coming to our session. So the first question we've got is what made you want to share your story? So for me, I wanted to find others that were in my position. It was quite a unique position to not have known about Huntington's disease and to also have already had a child and not known about it. Um, and through that, I wanted to raise awareness. I never knew about it until it came involved into my life. And I wanted to document my journey as to what I was going to decide, if I was going to decide anything. And through that, I wanted to help and support others in their journeys and for education to empower them, inform, and to get them to learn. OK, so this is me. <laughs> I've just climbed Kilimanjaro last week. Um, that's obviously how I got to share my story this year. Um, as some of you may know, um, Dad's in the final stages of his condition at the minute, and I've been really heavily involved in his care. And you know, there's been so many struggles for him and things. And for me, I wanted to dedicate something to his life, which was like a challenge for me, and it really was. Um, so I decided, obviously, to raise money for HDA and HDYO. And I think in total, we've just raised um, nearly £8,000. Um, <laughs> which is like a huge, huge sum of money. And that's all just been through sharing my story on Instagram. And obviously, um, just like strangers who have never met before um, on Instagram, you know, sending money because they've got HD in their family. So yeah, I think um, it's been really, really amazing. So for me, starting to share my story, I find Google a very, very scary place, like I'm sure many of the rest of you. When I was about 15 years old, my dad was diagnosed with HD. I always knew that my granny was sick and there was something. And I think I maybe knew that it was Huntington's disease, but I had no idea what those words meant. So when dad was diagnosed, I started Googling, what is Huntington's disease? And I got some really scary stories and um, that did not help my situation and it didn't help my understanding in it. So I spent a couple of years lightly getting involved, that kind of thing, started going to events and whatnot. And then when a certain event happened um, in 2016 where my dad was called drunk very publicly, which I mean, hands up whose loved one wasn't referenced to as drunk, you know. Um, that's when I decided that I wanted to share my story in a more public way. I felt like I had the voice to do it, I had the confidence to do it, and I was supported in a way that I could do it. So sharing my story was a way of coping for me, and it was a way for me to bring positivity to the community because I set myself a goal 15 years ago work out my age if you want. Um, I set myself a goal 15 years ago that I didn't want young people to bring up Google and type in what is Huntington's disease and find mental institutes and scary stories and horror stories and be traumatised by that. So I hope now when young people Google what is Huntington's disease, they find one of us, they find HDYO or they find a local organisation. So. That's what made me want to share my story. What were we nervous about? So, <laughs> set, being on social media. Um, so for me, it was being uh, it was being understood. So um, I wanted to make sure that people kind of realised why I wanted to do certain things and why I wanted to be so public about it. And like I said, you know. No one knew about it in my family, no one knew about it in my friends group, in my friendship group. And I was actually really scared about being accepted into the community. And the reason for that is, I'm not a caregiver. Um, I just had a young child and I just thought, where is really my place? Are people going to just think I'm a mad young mum who just thinks, oh, <laughs> you know, something might be wrong with my kid. Um, and for me, I hadn't been around for very long. 
I started this in 2019 and literally DM'd Ashley and that's how we got together and it's like, not that we're in a relationship, just a disclaimer. <laughs> um, and <laughs> like Ashley says, she's been in the community for 15 years and I thought, how do I even fit in? Um, and again, protecting my family, so, um, oh my God. <laughs> um, for my mum, you know, she suddenly found herself in my position in terms of I had Kian, she already had three grown-up children and suddenly they were all at risk too. So what I was going through, she was watching unfold by times like times two. Um, and also my boyfriend. So Kian was planned, but it was kind of a world of romance in terms of I met him, found out that I had endometriosis. Um, after three months, fell pregnant with Kian. And within a year, this all unfolded. And to kind of be in that position where suddenly actually, you're the father of my child and I don't really have a wild card to say you can go and leave. You're part of me now, you're a part of us. So it was really important that I was always honest with them as to how much I shared, who I didn't share, um, and yeah. Okay, so for me, opening up, the only thing that I really found difficult was that I, in my family, as I'm really, really public, you know, I speak about everything, I talk to anyone, I'll tell anyone my story, even if they don't want to know. But the rest of my family is really, really public, and there's a lot of them. I've got, like, sisters, I've got brothers, I've got about 40 cousins, and I'm the only one out of all of us who really speaks up at the minute. Um, so for me, to share my story so publicly on Instagram and, you know, to do all this fundraising, I didn't want them to be impacted by that. I didn't want to ha have to, you know, maybe share any information about them or, you know, people then asking them questions because they've seen my post and they're like, you know, is this the same for you? Did you test positive? And I was thinking, so I had to sit down with them and say to them, listen, this is what I want to do. It's for dad. This is, you know, something that's really important to me. Am, am I okay to share this on Instagram? And I had to, you know, like, they said it was okay, but not to include any details about them which is really hard when you're kind of just like in conversation because you just get carried away sometimes and you think, have I, have I mentioned something about someone else or have I said anything about my sister here? So it's always really like to be mindful about just staying focused about you and, you know, not making any assumptions about my feelings or my experience as if the whole family feels like that. So I always said like, you know, this is how I feel. This is what I've been through. But, you know, it's always different. And obviously my sisters both haven't tested yet. So their view on life is really different to how I feel at the minute. But um, yeah, they are. They, they did support me through the whole fundraising. They've helped me raise a lot of money. And I think from me sharing, they're not open to sharing, but they're, they're on the edge. They're getting there, which is positive for the whole family. I think by me speaking up about it in a family where it's been so shunned, it's, it's a lot. We're having a lot more open conversations, even in the family, which is progress really for us all. I was probably nervous most about judgment. I shared from 2016, I look at Charlie to like confirm with me when I started doing this. I shared publicly from 2016 my journey with dad and I always said I would share the good, the bad and the ugly. I would share the hard days, I would share the good days and I would share the days when I didn't want to share and I didn't want to talk to anybody and I wanted to lock myself in a room and cry and that's okay. There is a photo on my Instagram newsfeed with the ugliest crying face you will ever see. I shared that because I had had a visit in the nursing home with my daddy and it was really hard and I was really sad and I wanted to let people know that when you watch my stories and you see my newsfeed and you see this girl who's riding motorbikes and snowboarding and wakeboarding and doing all these really fun life activities and painting this really positive life that, you know, I might live at risk and I'm not tested yet and I'm 30 years of age. Did you do the math right? <laughs> Just, no? Um, I do have days that I'm scared and I do have days that I'm upset and I want to cry and that's okay. So I was afraid of the judgment. So I have, and I have received some things that have hurt me or upset me and that's okay because we're all human and we all have personal opinions. And how I managed my dad's care and how I live my life affected by Huntington's disease, not everybody's gonna do the same and that's okay. But it's how you deal with it and the support that you have 
there for you that can help you through that so it can. I had a great support system to get me through those judgments and those times that I felt like I was maybe being judged, but I always reminded myself of one thing, and that was my goal, that a young person wouldn't be sitting reading horror stories. And if I could help prevent that, then I can do this. I am strong enough to do this, so I am, and I have the support to get me through it because not everybody has a big brother that pushes them forward, has a mummy who literally texts me last night, keep making me proud. And that's, I have that, so I feel like I can put myself forward and I can do that for those who maybe are a bit nervous to or aren't feeling comfortable to yet. I'll be that person so oh well. So I was nervous about the judgment. I still do be, but I get through it and I keep going because I have that goal. So how did you get started? So like I said, I started in 2019 and I've included this image because um, I literally just threw up this um, image together because I was like, right, I've heard about Alzheimer's, heard about Parkinson's disease, heard about motor neurons disease. So why did I never hear about Huntington's disease? And especially so, because if we can cure this, we can cure all of this. So why did we not know about it? And I started researching, sharing facts that I made sure, you know, they were all correct through the NHS, so they were through, you know, HD charities, and like I said before, started connecting with other people online, and like, building myself up to think, you know what, I can do this, and like I said, I wanted to find someone just like me, so I could support someone just like me. And with connecting through others, and I'm going to pick at Matt, I can still remember <laughs> messaging Matt and being like, this is my situation, what can I do about it? And that's how I got involved with HDYO and, you know, with Ashley and meeting Robin. And yeah, and just a disclaimer that obviously it's so important that if you are going to do something like this, make sure everything that you share is correct it can be easily misinterpreted or misjudged and it's so important especially when there's amazing new research out there to be like this is exciting I want you to know about it I always love this picture when we it's, it's so <laughs> cute isn't it um, so obviously for me getting started it was you know what I wanted to choose the fundraising activity it was and obviously that was going to be Kilimanjaro which was something you know i love pushing myself out my comfort zone and i think for my mental health and my own well-being that's something that i always try and strive to do and i love hiking so it just kind of felt like the perfect way to do it um, and then obviously shared my story on social media and obviously started asking for donations and there was just a flood of the money coming in from like random people all over the world someone donated a thousand dollars from America, who I'd never met before, because they just see my story online through like a hashtag to do it, like speaking about it about Huntington's disease, and they've got Huntington's disease in their family, and they just felt connected through me sharing my story, and that they wanted to give the money up. And I actually woke up in the morning, I was crying, and I was like, you know, it's so overwhelming, and it's even in the best way, like you know, when you're sharing your story and you're getting all this support from people, it's like, you know. It, it, I feel really like, grateful that people are supporting me, so I like, help everyone else. So yeah, that's how I got started. So I started off, I kind of staggered how I wanted to do this. Um, I had no past experience of social media. I am not trained or anything. Um, so the only thing I think I read somewhere was don't try to do all the social media pages at once. Don't try to have a Facebook, a YouTube, an Instagram, a Twitter, and manage them all. Because I promise you now, you will never leave your sofa, because it just <laughs> sucks you in. So I staggered mine, you can see from the dates, you know, Facebook page in 2016, worked on that, built up a good bit of following, just simple posts, a photo, and a little bit of a bio, or a little bit of what happened that day, or what story I wanted to share. I then moved on to WordPress, which was a free website app, didn't pay for this, wanted to see if it was going to be worth it, if anybody would even want to listen to me, and it was pretty basic, and I'd done the best I could, and I was proud of what I could do, you know, it wasn't anything special, it was the best I could do. I then moved on to Instagram, and then I moved, um, I got a friend, 
you never know who's going to help you if you want to start doing this. A friend reached out to me. I'd love to get into logo creation. I know you have your blog. I see you don't have a logo. You just use a photo of you and your dad. Would you like a logo? And I was like, yeah, give me the anchor, give me the flower. My name's hashtag I'm not drunk. Put something together there, will you? And he came up with this and I loved it. I, as soon as I seen it, I was like, that's a bit of me, I'll have that. So got my logo created and then I thought, this is going really well, let's move on to a bigger website. So I have a Wix website. There is a small financial fee to that. I'm gonna say it's like maybe 50 pound a year or something. I felt like I could, I could cover that personally. So it's what I like to do, it's what I'm passionate about. Not gonna lie guys, I could go six months without posting on my website. My social media pages are always active. There's always photos, reels, videos, all that kind of stuff going up. The website, you're lucky. See you are. It depends what's happening. Sometimes topics don't warrant a full blog post. Sometimes they do. But you do what fits you and that's what I do. I see how I'm feeling. This is something I do in my spare time. It's a hobby. Everything I do with Huntington's disease at the minute, it's a hobby of mine, which sounds really funny, but <laughs> I do it when I have my spare time. I still do work full time. So my piece of advice, if you want to get started in something like this, um, do what you can. Don't put pressure on yourself and manage your workload in that way so that it doesn't become a task. Oh, I didn't put a post up the day. I didn't put a photo up the day. That's okay, you know, it doesn't matter, so it doesn't, but yeah. What's something that has been surprising? So, um, I'll tell you how I got to the decision to put myself forward for DNA Family Secrets with BBC with Stacey Dooley. So, I um, rung up a company to ask if, um, with the artificial insemination, things like that, if um, we would be able to qualify if we wanted a second child. At that point, I was at risk. I got told that my child, we wouldn't be able to get that because my child was deemed healthy. Okay. And I can't know his gene status or anything like that until he's 18. Okay. But I made him, so why can't I? And it kept going back and forth, back and forth. Very angry, very emotional. And I thought, if, I, if it's now or never, I've got to go and do it. And obviously, I was already quite public online, and I came across a Facebook post, and it said that the BBC are looking for someone who hasn't tested yet, and they want to follow their genetic journey. And I looked at Rob, my boyfriend, and I was like, should I, should I not? And Rob went, remember, you wanted the person you are right now someone else needs you right now. So I put myself forward, not gonna lie, Kean sealed the deal. He had the curliest locks that you could ever want, the bluest eyes. And I put myself forward and I just made sure that he didn't fast track me. I didn't wanna go in front of somebody else that was already on the waiting list. I wanted it all done as properly as possible. And I can remember them turning around and saying to me, but if your test comes back positive, you don't have to film it. It's fine. I said, no, it's not fine. You have to film it. Because at that point, I was working for a very large pharmaceutical company that I will not name drop at all, but their logos are like, let's feel good. Let's make people feel healthy and great about themselves. And I was signed off work because they couldn't cope that I was going through genetic testing. So um, I and I say this as nicely as I can, fortunately, I found out that I was gene negative. This got shared, and obviously there's a picture of Stacey Bell Kean, and that was so surprising, because so many people came forward and they were like, I know in the big scheme of things, it, all together it was only 30 minutes, but you put HD out there on BBC Two for people to see, and let's be honest, there's loads of um, shows out there that's like, who's your family, who do you think you are? But DNA is further than that. There's more to it than that. And like I said, finding positives in you, like doing you, me, and HD, like friendships, like with Ashley, like I see so many people, I would actually go through all the crap that comes with HD, go through the genetic testing again and again and again if it meant that I got these friendships. I would do it in a heartbeat. And surprisingly, <laughs> I took volunteer redundancy <laughs> after I got my test results. 
Um, I come back and they were like, you know what, COVID's come, we've put you on furlough. Don't know how you're going to fit back in here. Okay, love and leave you. That's fine. Two months after, uh, my CEO that works for Be Free Young Carers messaged me on Instagram and goes, you know, my family's affected by HD. I followed your story. I'd love you to be our social media manager. I'm now in my third year working with a charity, supporting young carers, people that are affected by Huntington's disease. And honestly, like, I love my job. I love my <laughs> life so much, like, so much. Um, and of course, you will see with Erin's book downstairs. So I met Erin again online, again, friendships. And um, again, with Ashley, we've created this amazing book. And I'm a girl with dyslexia, with a hearing impairment. I hated reading to think that I am like an author is just mind blowing. So, yeah. Okay, so for me, something that I found surprising was just, you know, the amount of support that I received. I think as a young adult today, you know, social media, there's so much negativity around it. You know, there's mental health impacts and all these things. and everything but what I think for me is you get what you want out of social media and a couple of years ago I was really really struggling with mental health and I just woke up one morning and I was like you know what I've had enough all this crap that's on my feed I'm just either going to get rid of it or I'm going to bring in new stuff and I literally followed about 50 different accounts you know due to like things that I found inspirational quotes and people you know feminists speaking out about things on Instagram and um, body positive models and just anyone who was completely authentically themselves I was like yeah I'm gonna follow I'm gonna follow because I knew that that was gonna inspire me and obviously I started looking for people who had HD and we're doing the same and that's obviously I've all found these two amazing humans um, and obviously the HDYO charity and then reaching out to them after sharing my story and then asking me to be an ambassador has just been it's been a, really, a really big roller coaster journey because obviously I felt like I went in to do one thing and it was solely for the fundraising and that side of it. But over time and over like the last six months, you know, the friendships I've made and the people I've been around and, you know, the constant connections and being around these people who were just so positive, it's really, really helped me on, on mentally and, you know, to accept my positive results. Um, and yeah, I think in the long run, it's going to help me so much more, you know, like just push that into my family because, you know, a lot of family aren't in the same position that I'm lucky enough to be in to be surrounded by these people. So I want to take that and send it into the, my family, really. I find over the past 15 years that the shift in the community was probably one of the most surprising things. I come from Northern Ireland and at 15 years of age I knew nobody. I had never heard of this disease and when I say I felt alone I really I was standing alone because I didn't know a single other person and I'm not the only person sitting in this room that could probably say that comment. I did then obviously quickly find the Northern Ireland charity and they have been supporting me ever since along with my dad and the rest of my family um, but to sit and look back at 15 years, I can remember in 2016 when I started, I don't know of a huge pile of other people. There was other organizations, yes. You know, I can remember in, you know, the early days, like I was at a talk, Matt was there and he's like, I've got this idea and I think it might work. And we're all going, okay, see what happens. And there we go, HDYO was created, you know. And, but I don't, didn't know of people, individuals, that was sharing the real, raw truths of it. And now, I mean, I could take up the rest of the day rhyming off names of people that do it, but it's amazing to see. Funny story, Instagram only lets you tag 30 people in a post. <laughs> Do I run out of tags? Yes, I do. Because I have more than 30 people that are doing the same thing as me that I want to tag and share and link and all that kind of stuff. So I've noticed a big shift in the community. And I think we can all agree with that. Look at the mighty young people that are here this weekend. 
you know, look at the amount of young people that are chatting and making friendships and getting involved. We are reducing that stigma that we all know about from years ago and we are seeing a shift in the community. I have support from around the world, which blows my mind. I went to America and people were like, oh, you're hashtag I'm not drunk. Huh? <laughs> Try being from Northern Ireland and deciding not to be like your blog's name. It's, <laughs> it's difficult. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's the love and the support that I receive. I, on a weekly and monthly basis, get messages from people um, thanking me and sharing their story privately with me. And it touches my heart. So it does. What was something that happened that was bad, right? Obviously, it says on there being gene negative, and I'll tell you why. It's not so much it's bad that I'm gene negative, but as Ashley said about like shifts in the community, there's also shifts when you go from being someone who's at risk to suddenly being in positive camp or negative camp. And trying to refine my place in the community online has been a struggle, to say the least. I can remember, must have been about a week, after I received my result, I had a message from someone that said, look, I love you, I love everything that you do, I've followed your journey, but I would love to be you right now. I'd love to be negative. And I'm, I'm unfollowing you because I can't deal with it. And I could have looked at it in two ways. I could have gone, do you know what, I'm really annoyed that they felt that they, had, they could say that to me, because I'm stood here now thinking, you know, I, for about five seconds, felt that relief and felt that weight off my shoulders, but I'm now suddenly thinking about a day that I might be caring for my brothers. I'm now thinking of a day that my dad will become symptomatic. I'm thinking about, you know, how our family has already been blown out of the waters because how do I talk to that person now who hasn't decided that they want to be tested? How do I talk to that person now that's now positive? Do I even have a voice in the room anymore? And that was really hard. But then I could have also looked at it and gone, fair play, because you're looking after yourself and, you know, we're all different and we're all on different journeys and I don't begrudge that person whatsoever. I wished her all the best in the whole wide world. And that's not going to stop me advocating being negative. It's not going to stop me because the fundamental thing is we're eventually going to be the caregivers. We're going to be the people that when they don't have a voice anymore, we give them a voice and we empower them. And that's how I've now kind of found my place in the community. And like I stand with two people today, one of them being at risk and one of them being gene positive and myself being gene negative. And I think, wow, we're still supporting each other. <laughs> we're still advocating for each other. And so regardless of what <laughs> happens TikToks. to us, we will still be championing each other. And that's the important bad into a good thing into an amazing thing okay i love that. <laughs> okay so for me something that i've really found hard was dating and the whole things around you know now that me story is so public it's like those conversations and those plans that i would have had with people that i'm dating they was they've all gone away you know they already you know from day one that I'm gene positive and it's kind of initially there was people that that was too much for them and it like you will get that and I found you know how I had to deal with that it, and it's kind of like you know it just is what it is and it, for me being so public on Instagram it's come around in a, in a better way because I'm having maybe fewer connections with people but those connections are more genuine you know, they know from day one what I am and what it comes with. They see dad, I post stupid videos of dad all the time. He's got him, um, he swears a lot. So <laughs> <laughs> there's always videos on the Instagram of him just like in absolute tears laughing, but, you know, saying a lot of C-bombs. Um, so they can see, you know, how that deteriorates over time and stuff like that just by seeing things. So... It has been hard and it was hard to swallow when people were just like, you know, just like I'd mention something and then there'd be no reply and it'd be a bit like, you know, what have I said kind of thing, is this me, you know, and you can kind of delve into it too much, you know, like, you know, 
what's going to happen or am I going to ever date and whatever. And before, when I first started going through the de- genetic process, I, I had a long period of time where I was like, you know, that doubt, like, you know, am I ever going to settle down? Is someone ever going to pick me f- with this condition? You know, when they can have someone who's not as much baggage, should we say. Um, but now what I've found is that the people who I'm making connections with, it, it, it's a more honest connection and it's from day one. And it, even though those conversations are taken away, it's how I d- deal with that afterwards. And, you know, maybe sitting them down and saying, you know, I know you might see my story, but, you know, is there anything you want to ask me? Or, you know, have you got any questions? Or, you know, maybe just like introducing them to dad so that they can see how he's how he is. He's in a care room at the minute. Um, but yeah, I think in the long run, it, ha- it has been beneficial for me. So I cared for dad for 15 years. He was diagnosed when I was 15 and he needed my help from an age when I was 17 and he passed away about six months ago so i did i think i'm, I'm shaking my head here going because it's like the end of august so it was um dad i think was more known around the world than i was <laughs> i might have been the one doing all the work for this and all the attempts to make reels and post videos and stuff but it was my dad that everybody loved and adored and you know he was he was a special guy and he, I used to go to visit him in the nursing home and he would actually go for my phone and like try to lift my phone. And I'm like, oh, do you want a selfie? No bother, <laughs> you know, who doesn't love a selfie? Um, but that also brought with it, I lost my dad incredibly publicly, so I did. Um, dad's death was posted before I'd even posted about it, so it was. Um, and that's fine, I'm not saying that in a way that I didn't get to do it, but I was glad somebody took that off me. Um, but it was losing dad publicly. I, it was hard, but I made sure to reach out and ask for help. So I did. I've learned the hard way over the years. There's nothing wrong with saying I'm not okay. I am joking this weekend without a doubt because Katie's sitting here with her mummy smile on. Katie is my family support worker back home and I was really incredibly blessed that she was also going to be here this weekend. So I have learnt the hard way to ask for support and she's been checking in with me every five minutes and I know I can say to her, I'm not okay, that session was tough. That, you know, I really resonated with that speaker and I, I need a minute, you know, and I do that now. I've always, my main goal is protecting my dad and making sure that he was okay and that I wasn't sharing things that was in a bad light, so it was. Um, so I always try to keep things positive in that way and share dad the basics, you know, looking good, looking nice and clean and healthy in a good seated position or, you know, that kind of thing. Nothing that would breach any like safeguarding if that, if people know what that is. Um, I know different countries and whatnot have different words for it, but yeah. How have you protected yourself? So, um, like I said before, testing negative. I deal with a lot of survivor's guilt. I always try to explain to people that my HD story has ended, my chapter has ended in my family tree, but I'm in this limbo space at the moment where I'm waiting for dad to may or may not become symptomatic anytime soon. Um, I'm seeing my nan decline and things like that, and also waiting for my brothers to make the decision. So at the moment, life's, life's a little bit of a breeze, but I know <laughs> that that can definitely change overnight. Um, and I um, am so passionate about kind of giving people who test negative a voice because um, we need to look after ourselves because we look after other people. And I was lucky enough to be part of the HDA's initiative of Huntington's in Mind where they came out and they you know, gave me time to actually speak about this and advocate for this. I've said before, make sure that your information is correct and the support is signposted. This one always makes me laugh, and Ashley knows why. Never ever fall for a scam, or because they've cured herpes for some bizarre reason. Doesn't mean that they have now got a cure for Huntington's disease. And you know, that may sound quite funny in the UK because we know there isn't a cure, but other cultures and even desperate people, because they want to look for something, 
that's what's important for me. If I ever see that on a post, it is reported and it's blocked straight away. <laughs> it is then put up on my stories for the world to see, to say, don't fall for this crap. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so for me, the main reason that obviously I try to protect myself is I've been a young carer for a large proportion of my life. Um, and it takes up so much of your energy, so much of your time. And for me to give, give my dad the best care and the best life that I've been able to, I've had to prioritise my mental health. And that means, you know, taking time out from days from him, having no time to see him, completely HD free days. Um, I meditate every day. I do a lot of cold water therapy. Wim Hof, if you know him, I do his breath works every morning. Um, and it's just these little like daily tasks that I've done over like the last two, three years that have helped me. Just like, you know, days when I'm a bit emotional or I'm a bit upset or I'll be anxious or what. It's like, you know, I might be meditating and I'll just start crying and I'll be thinking about dad, but it's a good way for me to release emotions in like a safe space. Um, so yeah, that's always like my number one priority because if I'm not at my best, then dad doesn't get it. And there's been times where I've had to take back, take a step back from his care about five years ago. And it was like, I was working full time. He was in hospital for like six months straight and we were like sleeping there every night on mattresses on the floor. And just to that point, I was at breaking point and I was like, listen, you know, I need to take positive changes to film my own sanity. And yeah, it's been really, really beneficial. So anybody who knows me or follows me, um, I'm a big promoter of finding HD free time, whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, a day. Imagine being that lucky. <laughs> a day off from life in general, you know? No work, no parenting duties. Oof. Um, but yeah, so it's living my life and not letting this disease stand in my way. I live at risk, so I do and I am going to do everything I can because if I test positive, if I test positive, I want to sit back and go, do you know what, I rode that motorbike, I went snowboarding, I done all them fun silly things, you know? Um, so yeah, I just protect myself by living the best life that I possibly can. It's one thing that my dad drilled into me. The man survived a plane crash and then got diagnosed with Huntington's disease and I have proof in the home videos that sit in my house. He had a bloody good life, so he did, because he was absolutely nuts with just his silly little activities that he used to get up to. So yeah, I live through, live through my dad's view living. We've only literally got like two slides left. That would be going to be very, very quick. Just bear with us, okay? <laughs> so one piece of advice and something that I want you all to remember is that you are more than a faulty gene. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Kian. I know hand on heart, <coughs> if I hadn't had Kian, I would be still in at risk and just let, you know, the science do the work and make sure my kid just didn't have it. Um, and what's really important is, like I've already said, you know, DNA is a part of all of us, but it, it makes us who we are. And for the sake of that one little mutation, don't let that just take over your life. Live out your dreams, live out what you want to do. Don't make mistakes and just, because the fact of the matter is, my mum said to me, I could walk out this room and I could get hit by a bus. So, <laughs> you know, um, and something that's quite personal to me is, one of the main reasons I wanted to get tested was for um, the possibility of having more children. I still went on and had a miscarriage. Life still happens. You don't have any guarantees in life and we've just got to move with every single motion. And I'll let Ashley. Like I said, have an amazing life. It's a snapshot of some of my favorite photos of the fun, silly things that I like to get up to. And that collage also um it shows the love and the support that i have so it does there's a lot of repeat people up there it's not a massive pool of people that i pull from but i am incredibly blessed to have some wonderful people in my life who encourage me and lift me up and push me to do what i do and you will have that in your life too it might be one person it might be 10 people it might be your entire local village but there is people there and you will find them and just live your best life because 
That's what I'm trying to do, fixing tractors and riding motorbikes. <laughs> Um, we did have a TikTok at the end, but we're going to be those social media people oh, that on. go go to our pages <laughs> to give us the view. Well, no, it would type. Come on, it's funny. People leave. Yeah, people They're <laughs> all our tags if you want to speak to us. And obviously, we're running out of time for questions. But if people want to ask us questions, meet us out there. We're more than willing to. Or watch the them. TikTok, which is so funny. Yeah. You know, it's really embarrassing for me. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> That's what we do in our time. Come on. <laughs>